<laughs> yes, hi, I'm Dr. Joseph Sugar, not the guy you really came to see, but thank you all for being here. And uh, I was at Dr. Bredesen's talk yesterday, and I'm going to try to fill in a lot of practical information for you today. Uh, this is, for me and my career, an enormous privilege to be able to interview Dr. Bredesen. He's truly one of my heroes. And, and I want to comment, uh, first of all, he, by way of introduction, he is a very serious scientist. You know, we're talking about he came from Cleveland, Ohio originally, but his college was at Caltech because he planned to devote his, his life to science. He went on to UC San Francisco he was there, uh, did his medical training in neurology in the 80s, right in the development of the AIDS epidemic. Of course, the University of California, San Francisco, was kind of ground zero. Mm -hmm. Met his wife across the table uh, of a patient. Uh, she was a medical student, and he was uh, farther along in his training. And, uh, and, and, and he decided to devote his life to the brain. Uh, and became a neurologist, but a research neurologist, and um, founded a research institute for the study of the brain and aging called the Buck Institute. You all can see that beautiful facility after you cross the Golden Gate Bridge on 101 and get toward Novato. You see it right up there, the Buck Institute for the Study of Aging, which is really his creation. Uh, he spent over 20 years looking for the magic bullet for Alzheimer's. You know, what's going to be the molecule, what's going to be uh, the, uh, the, the secret, and, and more than 20 years. And um, if you do the uh, pathology, you do an autopsy of someone who dies of Alzheimer's, uh, the prominent things are amylin plaques and these tau protein bundles. And, and tell us, that, uh, Dale, that you actually were part of the design of chemicals that were able to dissolve those things, speaking simply. So we, yeah, so I, we were looking for molecules that uh, have an impact on Alzheimer's. Uh, and the idea was that for people who are out in practice, we had nothing to offer. Uh, the medications for Alzheimer's really haven't done much, as you know. And so we were looking at how does this thing actually work, and the, the goal was, could we understand Alzheimer's disease at a fundamental enough level that we could begin to fashion the first effective treatments? And it became clear that when you start getting rid of the amyloid, it really doesn't make a difference in humans. It makes a difference in mice. And so mice, unfortunately, are not a great model. We can improve Alzheimer's without... <laughs> with, without having much positive effect on Alzheimer's, unfortunately. Well, and I think you describe it as those things are kind of the scar tissue to the tremendous inflammation in the brain that leads to Alzheimer's, and that inflammation comes from many, many sources. Yeah. So, you know, this is interesting because it has to do with how we, as a nation and as a, as a scientific community, try to solve this problem. And so, you know, we get little hints from genetics, we get little hints from epidemiology, we get little hints from biochemistry and pathology. And when you look at those hints, you look at the amyloid as being, oh, this is part of this disease. And back uh, in the 1990s, a professor from Harvard, a guy named Bruce Yankner, did an experiment where he put some amyloid on neurons and showed that the neurons degenerated. He said, aha, this must be caused by the amyloid. And it made a lot of sense until we started removing the amyloid and finding it didn't do any good. So the bottom line has been really interesting. Your body makes this amyloid that we associate, that we think that we have vilified in Alzheimer's disease, as a response. It's actually a protective response to different insults. So it's turned out to be just backwards from what we thought 25 years ago that in fact this amyloid is made because you have various bacteria that your brain is exposed to, various viruses that your brain is exposed to, various spirochetes, various molds, insulin resistance. So it is part, when your body makes that amyloid stuff, which is a little bit like molasses, it is actually protecting itself. It is, it is a, an antimicrobial. It actually kills 
some viruses and some bacteria. And you know, you look at the history of amyloid and you realize this stuff is a barrier. For example, bees make something called propolis, which also has an antimicrobial effect and also is a barrier. If a rat gets into a beehive, they cover the rat with propolis. And in fact, if you go back to sea squirts from eons and eons ago, they come to mate, and they literally, when they come to mate, they look to see whether the other sea squirt is the same as they are, is the right kind of sea squirt, or is it too far away to mate biologically. And what do they do if they decide, instead of swiping left, what they do <laughs> when they come together is they say, I reject you, they make amyloid and put it in between. So it's a barrier, and it's an antiseptic barrier. That's what we're putting in our brains. And unfortunately, when you're now doing this, you have what's essentially a scorched earth retreat. You are pulling back, you are decreasing the size of your neuronal network because of the ongoing insults. Therefore, what we want to know is, what are those insults, and let's deal with those. Let's talk about those insults and some of the high-priority ones. Um, we now live in a U.S. where 70% of Americans are overweight. They have excess body fat. 40% of Americans are frankly obese. Um, the, uh, that has led to an epidemic of type 2 diabetes. Right. Uh, and even before type 2 diabetes, there's this pre-diabetes of high blood yes. sugar. Yes. And, uh, and it's a doubling, tripling, and even quadrupling of your risk of dementia at any age as a senior. So what are we looking at with the frequency? What's happened to the frequency of this illness in our population? Yeah, that's a very good point. So it is true, as you said, prediabetes and type 2 diabetes do represent risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. And you can literally follow, as you go up on your fasting blood sugar, you go down on the size of your brain. You literally have an increased risk for now shrinking your brain as you get older. So it is true that this epidemic of obesity and type 2 diabetes uh, really bodes poorly for our future with Alzheimer's, and so we really need to, to do something about this. You change also your neurons respond to different growth factors. So when we would grow neurons in a dish to study these different factors, we always had to put some insulin in the dish to keep the neurons alive. So no big surprise, as you become resistant to insulin because you've had so much sugar exposure and you're heading for type 2 diabetes, your neurons don't get that same supportive feeling that they normally do from the insulin. And you can even literally follow the molecular changes that go with the insulin resistance. You literally see changes in the way phosph phosphorus is put on, so-called so phosphorylation, of the proteins that are involved in insulin signaling. Yeah. Now, you talk about three dominant mechanisms that lead to Alzheimer's, right. uh, atrophy, inflammation, and toxins. Right. And you talk about how toxins are maybe a 10% of the factor. It's an important factor. Uh, but the atrophy and the inflammation, which are led by blood sugar and inflammatory factors of foods and others, which are, unfortunately are all too common in our diet. Uh, so we have to go after it. It's the 36 holes in a leaky yeah. roof that you talk about that they all have to get plugged up. The, uh, how many of you in this room have had a colonoscopy? Raise your hand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah me too. Yeah. How many of you in the room have had a cognoscopy? A, a cog, now, don't feel bad, but it is a, it's a checkup on your brain. And uh, Dr. Bredesen invented the term, so you have to have read the book to even know what a cognoscopy is. Uh, but why don't you, you know, obviously you make the point, we all care about our colons, but yeah. we probably care about our brains even more. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and the lead up to Alzheimer's starts long before the first symptoms happen. Right. So even if you're co cognitively fine, if you over 50 or 60, I don't know what you recommend, you might consider a cognoscopy. What is right. that? 
Well, first of all, let me just say, so my wife and I decided years ago, you know, it's time for us to get a colonoscopy, and we hadn't had one. So we finally decided, look, we got to do this. And so we actually had his and hers colonoscopies on Valentine's Day. And we thought this would be a good way to make sure that we both, you know, are, are checked out. But of course, as you said, you don't want to forget the other end, right? So it's important to get your brain checked out. And so I, I made this silly term, you know, cognoscopy. Now, Maria Shriver said to me, don't ever use that term again, because we used it on a, on a little uh, Facebook Live uh, a couple of years ago. But the thing is, it's such an easy term to remember. It's a simple thing, cognoscopy. So the bottom line is, you want to know what's creating your risk. And so it's pretty straightforward. You can get a series of blood tests, pretty easy. Um, and you can actually even do this through mycognoscopy.com now. Or you can go to your doctor and talk to him or to show him the book. So you want to know the very things that you talked about. Is there evidence that I have systemic inflammation? How many people have heard the term inflammaging? Yeah, so this has been a term that's used a lot by the, by the medical community and the scientific community in the last about eight to 10 years. And so inflammaging is about the fact that when we have constant inflammation, which so many of us have, we are going to age more rapidly. That is part of the aging process. So when we can prevent that or resolve that, uh, we're gonna do better. So you wanna know that and then you wanna know, as you said, the status of various things that would, give your, would make your brain atrophic. So we wanna know your vitamin D. We wanna know your omega-3 status. We wanna know your hormonal status your estradiol, your progesterone, your pregnenolone, your testosterone, all of these things are critical. Your thyroid status, all of these are critical. And you can get this with a relatively simple set of blood tests. And then the second thing is, you wanna know where you stand cognitively, and you can now do this online pretty easily. There's a thing called CNS vital signs that we often use, but you can use things like MOCA, uh, test, which is Montreal Cognitive Assessment. That's a free online test you can do in about 12 minutes. And just get an idea, because this is something that can sneak up on us. Because, you know, we think, well, we're just having a few, you know, senior moments. You know, as they say, if you've got someone who, uh, who comes from Madrid, you know, and he's having trouble with your memory, that's a senior moment. <laughs> but, uh, sorry about that. So the idea, though, is we all have a few of these things. And um, we want to know, does this really mean that I'm the, on the way to bad things or not? So we want to know where you stand with this, and it can be pretty sensitive. And then if you are completely asymptomatic and you score well on your tests, that's it. You're done. You don't need anything more. But if you're having symptoms or you didn't score so well on your test or you have a lot of risk factors, then you want a third thing, which is simply an MRI of your head with volumetrics. You want to know is my hippocampus, that's right in here, deeply. It's an important area for memory formation, and it's a very important area for Alzheimer's. And it's one that is affected early and significantly in Alzheimer's disease. So you wanna know what that looks like overall, and wanna make sure that you don't have things like vascular disease, little strokes, and things like that. And that's it, then you get an idea and we use an, uh, an algorithm that we developed to tell you, okay, these are the things that are actually placing you at risk. So I think the bottom line here is, this has been throughout my lifetime, and for the last 114 years since Dr. Alzheimer's described it, this has been a, a complete failure. We haven't had anything. And now for the first time, there's hope. For the first time, we really can reduce this, we really can reverse in many cases, not all, but many cases, and we've seen it again and again and again and published it again and again and again. So things are changing, uh, and uh, that's what I'm most excited about. You know. One of the uh, most uh, dramatic chapters of your book is how to give yourself Alzheimer's. I may have not said it exactly right, but it's, uh, it's a pretty typical American uh, type of day, right, right. Uh, a typical commute around the LA area, for example, but the certain foods that are taken, uh, it's clear that we give ourselves Alzheimer's by creating an environment in our body and in our brain that gives us Alzheimer's. And what you have uncovered 
that if we change that environment, if we optimize the environment, the body wants to heal. Now, our bodies want to be healthy. We have stem cells, and we have the ability to heal almost everything. We know we can reverse diabetes, for example, and, and a lot of other examples. And you have pioneered uh, showing that if you create the right environment, you can reverse cognitive decline. When I was a medical student, we were taught that a normal fasting blood sugar was 60 to 90. Mm -hmm. Now, they base these normal ranges on the population that hasn't been diagnosed with a disease. But interestingly enough, not long ago, they had to change it to 70 to 100 because about 90% of Americans had a fasting blood sugar above 90. Uh, the trouble is that's not healthy. You've shown very clearly that if you want to get over cognitive decline, you need to get your fasting blood sugar below 90. You need to get your fasting insulin, uh, which is a broader marker of what's happening with your sugar, uh, below 5, uh, and get your hemoglobin A1C below 5.5%. So, you know, one of the dominant markers, if you want to get over cognitive decline and even prevent it, is to get the sugar down. And the other two big ones is, a, is we have measures of inflammation, and you right. prefer the, the C-reactive protein measurement and the homocysteine measurement. Tell us more about those, because I see that as the low-hanging fruit of uh, looking at the environment. Absolutely. So when I first arrived at UCLA, uh, a brilliant doctor approached me who clearly had early Alzheimer's uh, by PET scan, by MRI, by family, everything, and APOE4 positive. And we started going through all the things that he was doing. Uh, and this guy was doing everything wrong, had a you know, very high stress job, had a high HSCRP of 10, um, just you know, on it. He would go home, he would be so stressed during the week, he would go home on Friday night and literally get out a pint of ice cream and eat the whole thing. And, you know, I, I saw, finally said to him, I said, you know, you're giving yourself Alzheimer's disease. And he said, I need to hear that. And I said, Lou, you're, you're going to need to change all these different things. And he said, I need a dominatrix. <laughs> and I, so I said to him, I'm the wrong guy to talk to about that. <laughs> so the thing is that you're absolutely right. It turns out that when the doctors tell us, and when we tell you, hey, you know, you need to be in this range, which is the, what we call WNL, within normal limits, which is on every blood test. Of course, when I was a medical student at Duke, we also called it, we never looked. <laughs> so, so the thing is that you, it turns out that that only means two standard deviation from the norm, which is why they now have revised this up, because we're all sick. So in fact, this doesn't mean anything about what's good for your body. It doesn't mean anything about your risk to go downhill. So, in fact, you don't want to have your fasting sugar up at 100, even though it may be normal. It's within stu two standard deviations. Same thing with HSCRP. We all should know. How many people know their HSCRP? Yeah, about two or three people. Okay, really good thing to know. Because HSCRP is high sensitivity C-reactive protein. So when your body is inflamed by various pathogens or by a leaky gut or by the food that you're eating, your body responds, your liver actually makes a protein that's called C-reactive protein that tries to fight these things basically. And this thing actually sticks. It makes a little pentagon. It, so it sticks to itself in, in pentamers and goes around to try to help you. And so you can pick this up in the blood and say, and say, aha, this person has got ongoing inflammation. So we'd like to see that well below 1.0. And similarly, you mentioned the uh, fasting insulin, which I guess is now considered normal up to 25. Is that right? Yeah. Unbelievable. So and that just shows we're all exposed to far too much simple carbs, sugar. And so therefore, we ramp our insulins way up. We really should optimally. So what we're looking at is not what's two standard deviations. That's just what a statistician tells you. We're looking at what's optimal for your body. We want to see that your, uh, that your homocysteine, for example, um, is down at seven or below. That is an indication of your ability to methylate, which is part of your ability to fight off toxins, part of your ability to activate specific genes. This is a good thing to know about. And if you've got appropriate nutrition, et cetera, you'll see that. So yeah, we'd like to see your 
Homocysteine, seven or below. We'd like to see your HSCRP, which is an inflammation measure, less than 1.0. We'd like to see your fasting insulin, which is a measure of how much carbohydrate you're exposed to and how much it's jumping. Uh, we'd like to see that at five, four. Now, we worry when it's one because you're not, and your glucose is high, you're just not able to make enough. And one of the things uh, that uh, has been really helpful, and actually my, my wife has stressed this in her studies, uh, is to look at continuous glucose monitoring, so-called CGM. And you've probably seen the advertisements on TV uh, from Abbott Labs. They've produced something which is called Freestyle Libre. I have nothing to do with that, but I think it's a wonderful thing that they did. You literally put it as a patch on your arm, and it allows you to look at your glucose continuously for two weeks. So you can see what is it that I'm eating that is spiking this? It's actually going to potentially hurt me in the future. And then you can also see, when I go to bed at night, does it plummet? And some people do have that problem. If you are dropping your glucose too much when you're sleeping, or dropping your oxygen too much while you're sleeping, which is why we suggest everybody get their oximetry, get a little oximeter overnight. Your doctor can lend it to you, or you can uh, buy an inexpensive one. Check to see, are you dropping that too low? That's not good for your brain. So have you used continuous glucose monitoring, and do you like that approach? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm not, I do have my Apple Watch, and I do my continuous movement and exercise, yeah. but I've not, I, I use the fasting glucose, the fasting insulin, but, you know, I, I'm not sure it's going to be good for people to be watching their glucose all day. You know, I promote people to be in a ketogenic state because right. that's great, and I want them to be ketogenic part of the day. But the people who get obsessive compulsive about being ketogenic and they're measuring ketones all day, uh, are not, don't, they don't feel very good. Right. And they're hyper about it. And I just worry about continuous glucose monitoring where I'm be looking at our glucose all the time. Um, I, tr I focus on your body composition. Yeah. You know, if, if you want to have great glucose numbers, and if you want to have low inflammatory numbers, and then you want to have great lipid numbers, you get rid of excess body fat, right. especially in your trunk or in your gut. And, uh, and I work hard to reduce that, it's my mm -hmm. lean and fit approach, that the numbers all correct themselves. And uh, I'm not so sure it's, it's going to be that good for people to be watching their sugar all day. Sure. Uh, you know, your insulin is, is a rough reflection of your daily uh, glucose load. And, and so if you can get your fasting insulin down, you're right. doing a pretty good job. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, and our concern is mainly if you're doing something that's spiking it yeah. and that you're missing that. Now, in the long sure. run, as you said, I mean, that's going to be reflected in things like your hemoglobin yeah. A1C. But you brought up something important, I think, which is your ketones. So it turns out that this whole fad for you know, ketogenic diets, it turns out ketones are very helpful. And they actually are quite good to inhibit Alzheimer's disease. So you need fuel in your brain. Your brain actually uses about 20% of your bodily fuel and, and blood flow, even though it only represents about a tenth of that in terms of its overall weight. So it's a really a metabolically active tissue. And you've therefore got to use one of two things to fuel that metabolism. Either you're going to have to use carbs, which again aren't so good for you in the long run, or you have to use ketones. The, actually, the long chain fats don't get into your brain. So what happens is when your insulin is low and when you're, you have dropped down your carbs, your liver will now begin to take those fats and cut them up and make ketone bodies, which go through your blood, enter your brain, and then are used wonderfully by your mitochondria in your brain, which are the batteries of your brain and your cells. So you've now got an alternative energy source, which actually turns out to be one that's quite good for inhibiting and even reversing cognitive decline. And this is why we recommend people get into some ketosis. Somewhere, if you happen to measure your ketones, somewhere between one and four millimolar is where you'd like to be for what's called beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is one of the, it's really the dominant ketone body. You can also, of course, measure it on your breath with a breathalyzer, and then you're measuring acetone, which is a different ketone body, or you can measure it in your urine, and then you're measuring acetoacetate, which is the third ketone body. But any of those ways to make sure that you get some ketones, actually people notice 
they're less hungry when they have ketones that have come up. They're thinking better. They have moments of clarity and they've got a lot of energy. So it's actually quite a good thing. Now, people in the past have said, well, I'm gonna get into ketosis by eating a steak. Okay, yes, you can do it with pure meat, but the problem then, you lose all the good things. As you were pointing out, the article just this morning on, uh, on the flavonoids. So these are things that are so many things in plants that are actually quite good for you and inhibit Alzheimer's disease, um, and including things like high fiber diets, which help you to detoxify, help you to improve your lipids, help you to lower your sugars. So many good things that are coming from plants and especially organic plants. Uh, and so we don't want to lose that. So although you might use a, you know, a, a big steak at one point, you want to use meats fine. If you want to have it, that's great. But uh, we think of it more as a condiment and less as just the entire uh, you know, plate of steak. Let's lead into toxins, since that is such an important thing. And there's an old saying, it's hard to be healthy in a toxic world. Yeah. Um, uh, you talk about the smash fish yes. as a way to avoid mercury in fish. Uh, we have arsenic issues in our water and things. But uh, give us uh, some of your recommendations. First of all, uh, tell people what seafood you think is safest. Yeah. Uh, the smash variety, uh, and then any other toxin uh, tips you want to give the, the public here. Yeah. So, you know, when I was in medical school, we learned about toxins for people who had overwhelming levels of toxins. You know, what does it look like when someone has a massive exposure to mercury or a massive exposure to DDT? And of course, we're hearing recently about glyphosate and about cancers that can come from glyphosate. That's Roundup. That's Roundup, exactly. Uh, and so the big surprise to me has been that, in fact, what happens with these toxins is that they accumulate over years. And one of the things that happened early on when we were looking at patients with Alzheimer's is that we had a group of patients that didn't respond to the original treatment, reducing inflammation and dealing with their various hormonal and, and trophic issues and things. And we thought, what the heck, what's going on? They look different, they act different, and they're not responding. And so I started calling all the spouses and started talking and saying, you know, where did this person grow up? What have they been exposed to? And it turned out, to make a very long story short, these were people who had chronic exposure to specific toxins. And of course, Bruce Ames, developed the Ames test years and years ago for carcinogens so that we can know things that in our, are in our beauty products and things that we're eating, which ones are carcinogenic. But unfortunately, no one developed something for dementogens. Dementogens are the things that we're exposed to that are toxic that are increasing our risk for dementia. And they tend to fall into three groups. So metals, things like mercury. If you have a lot of exposure to mercury, as you said, in fish, or because you've got a lot of amalgam fillings, especially if some are leaking, then your mercury can go up. And you can easily measure this in your blood and urine and hair and fingernails, whether your mercury is high. So metals, things like mercury and copper and iron and things like that. And then secondly, organic things formaldehyde, benzene, toluene. We had one woman came from New York. She was, a, uh, she was a big executive. She'd done very, very well, but she worked in a place that burned paraffin candles 24 seven. And it turns out that paraffin candles are quite toxic. Fine to be around them for a few minutes. You don't wanna burn them 24 seven. If you're gonna be burning them longer, think about beeswax or something else. Um, and she ended up developing Alzheimer's disease in her 40s. And it turned out she had very high levels of the very toxins that are in the paraffin candles. So we want to stay away from this long-term paraffin candle burning. And you can look now, there are tests again to look at organic toxins. And then the third group is biotoxins. So no surprise, not only are we spraying to keep aphids away and things like that, but the, the other organisms are spraying us. So in fact, when you live with mold, there are many mold species, not all, but there are many mold species such as Stachybotrys, um, Aspergillus, Penicillium. These are ones that actually make toxins and they especially make them when they're trying to defend themselves. So when we have fungicides around, when we have treated wood around and things like that, 
these organisms will make toxins to try to survive. And we then inhale them over years, not knowing that we inhale them, and they actually cause Alzheimer's disease, unfortunately. So it turned out these people that were in the group that wasn't responding, when we now started to detoxify them, started getting better. And it became clear that toxic burden is quite important. And many people have multiple toxins, and so now you've got to look at the different ones, help them to detoxify, and then, of course, help them to be resilient. So good to know whether we've got these right. things. Well, listen, let me get back to seafood because we love our yes, seafood, seafood here in California. Fish. Okay. The, uh, you know, the concept is big fish that eat smaller fish concentrate yes, mercury. Exactly. I used to eat ahi tuna a couple right. times a week. I don't anymore because yeah. um, tuna is a big fish and it has a high risk of mercury. You recommend the smash fish, the salmon. Right. Mackerel, mackerel family, but not king mackerel, right? Uh, yeah, anchovies, anchovies right. Sardines, sardines, and herring, and herring. which the... you know is a limited. How about shrimp, for example? Yeah, so you know Stephen Gundry, uh, who's right in this area, who practices, uh, you know, loves uh, other seafood like shrimp, and I think again, as long as the shrimp aren't. Uh, it's, you know, aren't uh, brought from a toxic area, they're fine. So yes, other forms of seafood, as you said, you don't want uh, people, you don't, you don't want to have it so that you're eating long-lived, large-mouth fish, because those are the ones that concentrate the mercury. And I had a really interesting call a couple years ago from a 54-year-old man, very successful guy, who had just been diagnosed with early Alzheimer's, and like, where did this come from? And I said to him, look, you know, you have this type 3 Alzheimer's. You have some toxin because of his presentation. We don't know what it is yet, but let's find out. He said, no, I live in a really healthy area. Everything's great. So it turned out when we looked into this, he had the highest mercury level that the laboratory had seen in three years, just a massively. So if you look at the 95th percentile for our country for mercury, his was seven times the 95th percentile. It was massive, and we thought, how the heck did you get so much mercury in your system? Well, what it turned out is that, first of all, he just genetically wasn't particularly good at excreting the mercury, so he didn't have a good excretion level, which you can easily measure. And then what had happened is he had gotten very successful in his business, and he said, I'm going to have tuna sushi a couple times a week because I love it. And he just started eating tuna sushi left and right and left and right and left and right, not realizing. And so he got to the point that he you know, had having trouble with his memory. And unfortunately, mercury actually creates the same molecular changes in the brain that we associate with Alzheimer's disease. And so we actually got him on detoxification. His mercury has come down to normal. His memory has gotten better, and he's done very well. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of the fish we really like out here and specialize in, like sea bass and, and swordfish and some of these others, are unfortunately on the list of potential mercury sources. And you can look up to see which ones are the highest and the lowest. And again, yeah. a general rule is the large mouth, long live ones you want to stay away from, like tuna. But that doesn't mean, you know, yeah, you can eat tuna every once yeah. in a while. You just don't want to be having it so much. And check your mercury level. Yeah. Again, easy thing to do to see whether it's low or high. Because if it's high, think about bringing it down before you have cognitive decline. One thing about the cognoscopy, you mentioned the diet, the neurocognitive testing yes. uh, as part of that, and the volumetric MRI. You didn't mention genetic testing. Right. And um, you know, I went and got mine, and I'm, I'm a carrier of the APOE4 gene. Uh, so that's, uh, that's there as a not two genes, but one gene, right. but that increases my risk. Talk about the importance of getting those genetics. And I want you, a lot of people say, I'm not going to go get my genetics because I don't want to get bad news I can't do anything about, which, of course, right. your book shows, I mean, you have a party of all the APOE4 people uh, that right. have reversed their cognitive decline uh, every year. But uh, talk yeah. about the importance of genetics and how to, how to practically do that. Right. So one of the most poignant moments we've had is when a whole group of people who had found their, that they were APOE4 positive, and therefore, and they had been dealing with this with their families and having people that, you know, getting Alzheimer's disease uh, and, you know, from generations. Um, and they came to the Buck Institute to visit, and we all, we all congregated, and they started telling their stories. And they have an online 
a group which is called APOE4.info. There are about 3,500 people worldwide who are all on this and all following, and they're all now starting to get on this, this protocol. Mo the vast majority of them now are already on some version of the protocol. But for the first time, they had some hope. And so they were telling their stories about how they'd been told, you know, just go home. It's going to happen. There's nothing you can do. Um, the woman who started it actually named Julie G, who's an APOE 4-4. So she's in the highest group and already had had symptoms, who's done very, very well. She had first gone to a neurologist and had to wait months to get in. And she said, look, I found out I'm APOE 4-4. I'm already having some symptoms. Could you just help me to at least stay where I am? And the doctor said to her, good luck with that. Uh, that's how bad things are in the community, unfortunately. So she's actually done great. And by the way, uh, helped write this next book, did a fantastic job, along with my wife. Uh, and so the, you, know, you should find out your, ge your genetic predisposition because there's a tremendous amount you can do. This old idea that there's nothing you can do about it is absolutely wrong. There's a tremendous amount you can do, and the earlier the better. Prevention and early reversal, fantastic. Now, if you have zero copies, 9% chance. One copy, 30% chance in your lifetime. Two copies, well over 50%. So if you do find out that you're genetically predisposed, Good, you know, good information to know. Get on the appropriate things, just as you're doing. And you know, we really can, together, we can make this a rare disease, which is what it should be. Well, the RECODE protocol, also known as the Bredesen protocol, can actually regrow your hippocampus. One of the things that's exciting is that you've taken people who have a very reduced hippocampus right. size, your memory center of your brain, and it grows all the way up to 85%. The radiologists were convinced that this, this right. was a mixed up, uh, couldn't, it never happened, but you've demonstrated it. So in the time we have left, let's talk about DESS plus, right. the uh, Bredesen protocol uh, and the elements, because every one of these elements is vitally important. Yeah, and this goes back to what you had pointed out earlier with how, you know, how to give yourself Alzheimer's. Yeah. And I, I wrote that because so many of us are doing the things that do predispose us to Alzheimer's disease and you know, having uh, ongoing inflammation and not evaluating our gut status and eating too much sugar and getting too much mercury exposure and living with mycotoxins, on and on and on, that are all critical. Uh, and so if you now look at, okay, we're just gonna, we're gonna reverse engineer that. We're gonna optimize these things. And actually, if you put up the, uh, the, there's one slide here. If you put that up here, it'll go through some of these things. You'll be able to see, there we go. Okay, good. So it turns out that all we're really doing, we're looking in your brain at your biochemistry. Your brain is literally, when it has Alzheimer's, it is signaling it's time to pull back because we have to, we essentially have to protect ourselves. No different than what you would do in your country if you had people invading your borders, you'd say, okay, we have to pull back and we're now gonna put napalm or we're gonna put something on these. That's what you're doing. Amyloid is like napalm. You're putting that on the invaders. So what we wanna do is we use an algorithm to subtype and then address each thing. So number one, you wanna get a plant-rich ketogenic diet. You wanna get yourself into mild ketosis. You wanna do exercise, both cardio and strength. You wanna make sure you don't have sleep apnea. You wanna make sure you're not desaturating at night. You wanna actually reduce your stress or manage your stress levels. And you wanna make sure that you have good oral health because it's the very organisms in your mouth that you find in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's. That's why they're making the amyloid. You often find those organisms. Then brain training in the, uh, with a background of, of a optimal biochemistry, very helpful. Healing your gut. Prebiotics and probiotics turn out to be very helpful. Your gut microbiome is huge. And then optimizing your immune system. Your immune system has essentially two parts, an older part, which is a general inflammatory part, and the newer part, which is a targeted. You're now going after the bad guy. As long as you're not doing that second part, which is what fails as we get a little older, that in fact you've got this chronic inflammation. So as you now activate this specific part, it helps to turn off the older part. It's that chronic turning on of the earlier part that is associated with Alzheimer's. And by the way, that's what the amyloid comes from. It's part of your innate, which is the older part of your, 
your immune system. And then we want to target specific pathogens. We want to identify the toxins, as I mentioned. We want to optimize your vascular system. Consider EWOT, which is this exercise with oxygen training uh, or oxygen therapy. And then for some people, stem cells also can be helpful in the right circumstance. Hopefully most of us don't need those. But it's again, it's part of the overall armamentarium. The armamentarium for this disease is large, and it's more and more effective the earlier and earlier you start. Well, that's great. You know, you, you talk about it as, you know, in the book as a very healthy version of a Mediterranean diet, which right. is plant-rich but also has some healthy seafoods and, and some degree of meat. So it's not a vegan or vegetarian diet. Just up the road in Loma Linda, there's a brain health clinic in which a uh, husband-wife neurology team used the, the Seventh-day Adventist plant-based diet uh, for preventing Alzheimer's. But, um, and I've gotten training in this functional medicine, and I still remember the brain health lecture that, uh, you know, there are so many superfoods, and I describe on my website uh, the 52 superfoods, yeah. uh, but, but broccoli and walnuts are like the superstars uh, yeah. for methylation. And so I actually eat broccoli and walnuts every day, wow. uh, you know, right. as part of it. I have walnuts in the morning as part of my little morning bowl that has nuts, but yeah. the walnuts are the stars. And then yeah. as I get my you know, at least good green vegetables twice a day, I make sure one of them have some broccoli in them. And, uh, you know, even when my wife drags me into Panda Express, I can get yeah. broccoli, beef, yeah. or, or, or the, I always get the vegetables instead of the rice or the chow mein, you know, and they, they actually have pretty decent uh, oh, yeah. fresh vegetables there. But mm -hmm. you, 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 you want to learn to look for things. The article today in neurology talked about the flavonoids, and there's right. four different ones. If you eat a lot of flavonoids as a senior, this was a study of only seniors, you had 40% less Alzheimer's than people who didn't. And of course, that's kale and healthy legumes, and, and uh, it's, all, it's all vegetables uh, yeah. and, uh, and things. Uh, you know, the big thing about legumes is Dr. Gundry doesn't like legumes because right. of the lectin the content, yeah. but you can reduce that, and, and uh, the healthiest people on earth eat a lot of legumes. Yeah. But it's really about very healthy eating. The exercise is vitally important, should be about an hour a day if you can. We should yeah. all be making sure we're doing the steps. The sleep, you make a big point. Uh, one of the big problems out here is people use medicated sleep. Right. Uh, they've, they've forgot the art of going to sleep on their own. Yeah. And, and they get dependent on medications. A lot of them are either like Zolpidem, Ambien, or mm. anticholinergic uh, drugs, all of which are associated with developing Alzheimer's. So, mm. so it's a really relearning. I mean, melatonin, which is actually an anti-aging uh, yeah. supplement in itself, is fine, but you know, they're using, they're, they're dependent on medications for sleep. Do you want right. to comment on that? Yeah. So this is a really good point. When you are forming memories in your brain, there's a whole set of steps. It would be just like booting up your computer. There's a whole set of steps that has to happen. And in fact, one of them is to have a specific neurotransmitter so this is being spritzed on one neuron by another one to connect them, and this is called acetylcholine. It's something you make, and it's one of the reasons that you want to have some choline, which comes from egg yolks, for example, and liver and things like that. So you need that acetylcholine, and there are many medications that have an anticholinergic effect, things like Benadryl, for example, uh, and these things, unfortunately, over the long run, can impair your memory. So you've got to be careful about those. And, and of course, some of the uh, sleep things, uh, the, you know, some like the scopolamines and things like that, of course, can impair your memory. That's mm. the whole idea of uh, you forget before you went to sleep. Uh, and they are oft, therefore often used with anesthesia. And by the way, one of the biggest problems we run into is people who've had multiple or prolonged anesthetic procedures with general anesthesia. So if you're going to have some anesthesia for a hip replacement or for, or for uh, anything that's going to take a while, please talk to your anesthesiologist. Number one, do I have to have general? Number two, can I get ready ahead of time and make sure that your glutathione level, which handles detoxification, is optimal? Number three, make sure to keep your blood pressure appropriate. Often the anesthesiologist will say, oh, low pressure's good. Well, not if you've been used to a higher pressure. So make sure that they keep the pressure up, 
the oxygenation up so that you're supporting your brain because a very common story we hear is this person had four hours of anesthesia or had multiple anesthetic procedures in the last year and now is in early stages of Alzheimer's. Yeah. It's an important, anesthesia is an important dementogen, unfortunately. So these are all critical. Because the Steinbeck room is so large, we are told we cannot be trying to do Q&A here. Besides that, we are down to 15 seconds and counting. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Dr. Bredesen is going to be signing books at the table. So as you get your books signed, you can talk to him. But thank you for coming. Thanks thank very you. much.